Yo, what's good, everyone? I am Dr. Nee, joined by... Dr. Renee, jet lag. We jet lag because we are in Ghana, West Africa. Yes, we are here for our medical mission trip, as well as an opportunity for me to see my side of the family, kind of reconnect with them. And we talked about this on episode 371. As a matter of fact, on episode 371, we didn't just talk about going to Ghana. We talked about how you can make that trip tax deductible, mm-hmm. not just going to Ghana, but any type of international trip. If you follow a certain guideline, you can make that trip tax deductible. So yep. go back and check out episode 371. But here for 372, we are here. And look, we're going to be really honest with you. As we're here working in Ghana, we're going to be really busy. And we're not going to have time to put out as many episodes. As a matter of fact, we're not even going to have time to put out episodes. So we're going on hiatus. We're on hiatus. We're taking a vacation. <laughs> Renee was looking at me like, we ain't putting out episodes. <laughs> <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> <laughs> but we don't want you guys, we're never going to leave you guys high and dry. So we don't want you all to worry and think that there's going to be like this huge break. There's not. So what we decided to do is we're going to go back and replay all of the top highly downloaded episodes that you all listen to. We're going to replay all of those for the next several weeks. And we're going to talk about in the beginning of each of those episodes, we're going to talk about some important things, some important tips that you all can learn to make if you decide to do a medical mission trip that much easier, as well as some other tips that we will pick up along the way. Yeah. All right. So listen, before we jump into this episode, this episode, by the way, is going to be with Dr. Jordan Grummet. Mm -hmm. And the episode mainly was about what dying can teach you about financial independence. And it was um, our guest was Dr. Jordan Grummet, who is host of the very popular Earn and Invest podcast. Which we have been uh, guests on previously. Yes, we've been guests on there. He's been a guest on our show. Actually, mm-hmm. I think this is the second time yeah. he's been on yeah. our show. He's also a hospice doctor, and he reached financial independence a little over 10 years ago. Yeah, so he and he's an author of Taking yes. Stock. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, which... And eventually, I have to do a book review on. Yeah. Um, But basically, it's a, I guess, a manuscript Mm -hmm. on what people who are dying, some of the regrets and some of the things that they're not very regretful about, what all of that stuff has to do with money as well as dying. Um, You'd be really surprised when you're on your deathbed what you're really concerned about versus what you're not concerned about. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has nothing to do with money. Yeah. But before we get into this episode... If you are a doctor, here are three shocking things you need to know before joining a medical mission. Number one, you need a visa. So a visa basically is permission to enter into a country. Yeah. Depending on which country you go to, you need a visa. Some countries you don't, but a lot of countries you really need to get some type of permission. And you have to state why you're going there, how long you're going to be going to this country, who's actually or whose residence you're going to be staying at where you're going to be practicing at. There's a lot of information that you got to list and let a country know where you're going to be at before you enter into the country. Once you submit all of the paperwork, including all of those questions that they may have for you, then you'll be given a visa and you'll be allowed to enter into their country. Yeah. So don't think that you can basically go to any old country and think that I'm just here to work. (laughs) I'm just here to work and that's it. Um, So sometimes people are shocked that they need a visa, maybe for a developing country. And yes, developing countries also might require for you to have a visa. So, you know, just because you may not require it, require a visa for, let's say, a European country, doesn't necessarily mean that if you go to the African continent that you're not going to need one because we certainly did need a visa in order to come to Ghana. And we applied for, or actually you guys applied for a five-year visa. Yeah. So not only did they answer the questions that were needed, you also get an opportunity to apply for a one-year visa, right? So you get permission to apply Mm -hmm. as many times, or excuse me, come into the country as many times in one year. Mm -hmm. Um, You you also have the opportunity to apply for a three-year as well as a five-year visa also. Mm -hmm. Now, oh boy has got a Ghana passport, so I don't need none of that stuff. So, (laughs) just the perks of being Ghanaian also. Yes. (laughs) Number two, you need vaccinations. And depending on which country you go to, that's gonna determine the type of vaccinations that you will need. So for us, we went to cdc.gov, checked out Ghana, and for Ghana, we needed hepatitis A, hep B, 
We also needed typhoid, yellow fever. And then the one thing that is not a vaccination that we got to talk about is malaria prophylaxis. Okay, so we are taking malarone, which for us is a daily medication that we're taking to prophylax us from getting malaria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And remember that some of these vaccines are they're not just optional. So in Ghana, I know we mentioned a, a few vaccines, but the yellow fever vaccine, you will not get into their country without having a yellow fever vaccination. That is the first thing that they asked us when we got to immigration. Yeah. Where is the yellow card with something that's documenting yellow fever? Yes. And they, they want to see it. Otherwise, they will potentially send you away. So, you know, don't skimp on those things. And I mean, if you're I don't know what happens if you're not into vaccinations or if you have an allergy to vaccinations, you might want to check before getting on the plane, um, because that might be a really expensive flight to not get where you're going. Number three, you need a medical license. So also, once again, depending on which country, but I think for the most part, most countries you need to get a medical license in order to give you permission to practice in the country. You're not gonna be able to go there and just willy-nilly just practice medicine without having the governing body actually look at all of your credentials, similar to someone who wants to practice in the United States. The same type of thing would happen if you're going into another country. You have to be able to show all of your qualifications, credentials, when you graduated from medical school, when you finished residency, where you did your intern year, all of those things that you use to get literally a license in any state in the United States is the same for the most part type of process that you'll need before you do medical mission work in another country. Yeah, I think sometimes the thinking is, well, if I'm going to a developing country, you know, I might not necessarily need a license because of, I guess, the 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 culture of medicine around international grads, right? Well, but also I think a lot of people think that, well, because, and this may be true, when there's an emergency that's going mm -hmm. on, like when you went to Haiti right. in 2010, right. when there was the earthquake and fresh off of the earthquake, you right. went like a month afterwards, right. or if you're going maybe someplace else in a war-torn area, yeah. it may be an emergency and they don't have time for that. Right. Those are different, they but wait, that doesn't yeah. happen very, very often, often though. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, just keep that in mind that you most likely are going to have to get some sort of documentation that you are medically trained. Um, and, you know, it, it might be a little bit of a process. So just be prepared for that. But listen, I hate to shock you guys with all of these things, but it is the truth. And we want to make sure that wherever you do a medical mission, obviously people in that country are going to need your help. But let's also make sure that you're doing it the right way and not getting turned around at the border because that's going to be an expensive ass flight <laughs> or plane ticket back. But anyway, guys, it is late. It's about three o'clock in the morning here. We got to get started on our medical mission work in the morning. So without further ado, Alfred, go ahead and run the tape for this episode. If you do not have enough money, you will pretty much do whatever you need to get money. It's the same with oxygen, right? If you are gasping for air, you either get oxygen or you die. It's about the only thing you can think about. But here's the interesting thing. Once you have enough oxygen to breathe freely, once you have enough money to cover your basic needs, having more doesn't necessarily make you better or happier. Once we do cover our basics, our striving doesn't end. We still Still are in this mindset that more is better, we turn it into a goal. If we just pump in more oxygen, mm -hmm. we're going to be better. But in fact, it may be damaging. Look, we all got different needs, wants, and goals in life. As doctors, locum tenens definitely needs to be a part of that conversation. But you might wonder, how do I find out if locums is good for me? Here's my answer. Go to an unbiased, informative source like locumstory.com. You'll learn all the ins and outs of locums, details on travel and housing, how to find different jobs, tax information, and more. Get a comprehensive view of locums and decide if it's right for you at locumstory.com. Link is in the show notes. Have you heard of the Healthy Conversations podcast? If you're looking for a podcast that moves the health conversation forward, then I highly recommend Healthy Conversations, the acclaimed podcast from CVS Health. Hosted by Dr. Daniel Kraft, the Harvard and Stanford trained physician scientist, Healthy Conversations provides both inspiration and cutting edge information about the forefront of medical practice. 
You can find it wherever you're listening to Docs Outside the Box. And don't forget to subscribe. And to make it easier, the link is in the show notes. All right, everyone, we've got Jordan Grummet, MD, also known as Doc G, also known as the host of Earn and Invest podcast. And you are here, Dr. Jordan, to talk about your book called Taking Stock. I feel like I'm really proud of myself now to be like a podcaster. I feel like I'm a journalist and I'm getting a book that says not for resale. Like this is like the advanced copy. Like I finally made it and I finally get advanced copies of your book. But I'm looking at your book right now. It's called Taking Stock. A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. It's coming out August 2nd on paperback, on Amazon. Dr. Jordan, welcome to Docs Outside the Box. How you doing? I'm doing well, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Yeah, man. I'm excited to hear you. Uh, I've heard you. I know you're doing you know, your book promotion right now. You're doing the podcast circuit. Um, but I'm sure when you go on other podcasts, it's a little bit different. Let's just make it like we're having fun. We're kicking it having pizza, having some grape soda and kick it like we're on your show. So, um, you know, when you came on a show like two years ago, one of the things that I really resonated with is the story of you becoming a physician and just kind of always thinking about the next step, fixing the next step and wondering and hoping that that will like kind of bring more fulfillment to your career. So what I mean by that is there was a point in your in your career where you're like, you know what, I'm not getting enough from what I'm doing currently as a physician. Let me switch to a different practice style or let me switch to an outpatient style or let me start getting more money. And then whenever you reach that goal, you realize, like, this is not enough for me. I want to do something different. And I was thinking about that with myself. I was like, you know, there, there have been points in my career, it's only been 10 years, where I've said, well, I want more money. Well, I've gotten more money and I still wasn't happy. Or, you know, I want to change the practice style. I want to be an independent contractor. And you get to that point, you're like, ah, it's still not happy. And I've, I've kind of realized that this game is really about really setting your own cards up and playing your own game with the current atmosphere of how healthcare is. And you kind of just go from there. Um, so I was really interested when you sent me this book, you know, Taking Stock, because I'm really interested and what a hospice doctor has to say about the fire movement, financially independent, retire early. So, you know, with that long intro, let's, let's jump into it. So why did you start off with money is oxygen? I was really interested on, on the order of your book. Because I think we're stuck with this dichotomy, right? If you do not have enough money, you will pretty much do whatever you need to get money. It's the same with oxygen, right? If you are gasping for air, you either get oxygen or you die. If you don't have enough money to put food on the table tonight, if your car just broke down and that's the only way to get to your job and rent is due, it's about the only thing you can think about. But here's the interesting thing. Once you have enough oxygen to breathe freely, once you have enough money to cover your basic needs, having more doesn't necessarily make you better or happier. And I think the oxygen example, the metaphor really demonstrates what we struggle with in money is we are so concerned about covering our basics, but once we do cover our basics, our striving doesn't end. We still are in this mindset that more is better. And as opposed to being a tool, right? Money is a tool that covers our basic needs so we can do other things. We turn it into a goal. And once we turn it into a goal, because having extra oxygen doesn't do anything for you, neither does having extra money past a point, we found our, find ourselves bewildered and unhappy because we think that if we just pump in more oxygen, right? If we, if we turn it up in doctor parlay, if we turn it up from two liters to five liters, mm -hmm. we're going to be better. But all doctors know that once your oxygen saturations are fine, there's really no reason to push up the oxygen more. And in fact, it may be damaging, right? It's not probably good for the heart of the lungs to give people too much oxygen. Most people don't realize that sometimes having too much money can damage you too, or certainly making money as your goal can set you up for unhappiness. Interesting perspective. I agree with that. You know, I when I started this show, and even to this day, when I'm creating episodes, I'm always I always have that one avatar, that one person who I really want to get the message of the show. And it's usually someone in their late to late twenties, early thirties, immigrant background, possibly, pot more than likely first person to graduate from college or to go to college. Definitely first person to be in med school. Money, it comes from an environment where money is tight. You know, so the, the beginnings of what you said, I definitely get. Like, you know, 
money is like oxygen. And sometimes trying to tell people, well, maybe you need to slow down or maybe you need to be a little bit more efficient with how you're getting your money. A lot of people, people like me growing up, like, look, look, Dr. Jordan, I hear what you're saying, but I don't have time for that. I'm trying to collect money. I'm a sandwich generation. I got to take care of my parents. And if I have kids, I'm going to have to take care of uh, my kids. I'm also going to have to take care of myself. And I never made this much money before. So I feel guilty if I don't make this money. Talk to me about what it's like from your end, from your perspective as someone who reached a certain plateau and then realized that, you know, money, this hoarding of money, it just wasn't healthy anymore. And it didn't even bring happiness. Talk to us about that. And I definitely do. And I also want to point out the fact that I think some of these messages are just important, as important when we don't have enough money as when we have enough or too much. Let's talk about enough or too much, which was certainly where I was when I decided I didn't want to practice any medicine anymore. I realized I had enough money. And instead of being elated, I ended up depressed and having panic attacks. The reason why is I had spent so much time thinking of money as the goal. I didn't do any of the harder work, really trying to get down to what is that money supposed to get for me? What is my Hmm. deeper purpose, identity and connections? What am I really striving towards? It was easy to decide that that was money. In a sense, I was letting myself off the hook, going for the lowest hanging fruit. The problem with that is at some point you get to enough or close enough to enough money, and then you realize that you don't know what to do with all that angst, fear, and energy. You don't know what to do with all that life force you built up because you've created this incredibly extensive and strong tool the tool of money, but you don't know how to deploy that tool towards a goal of living a better life. So you get into this overdrive situation, what I call it in the book, where you start seeing your money goals as the point and you get to a better money goal. Maybe you get to a higher net worth. And instead of being happy, A, you're afraid of losing it because loss aversion is this big problem where we're doubly scared of losing than we are of never attaining. So loss aversion hits us. And not to cut you off, but I've seen people do episodes on they've saved enough on their emergency savings. They have an emergency and they feel guilty for using their emergency yeah. savings to do so. Yeah. So not to cut you off, but that this is a real thing. Yeah. So even once you have enough money, you're petrified that you're going to lose it. And so what do you do? You set up the next higher up money goal and that becomes your purpose and meaning. And you get into this overdrive situation where your wheels are spinning, but you're not getting anywhere. You're accumulating more money, but you're not using that money towards creating a better life. That's what happens when you have enough. I think we still have problems even when we get to people who are just like you said, at the beginning, you were in the sandwich generation. You're worried about supporting your parents. You're worried about about supporting your kids. We assume because we're in that situation that we can't start thinking about our purpose and identity because we don't have time. Yeah. Ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah. I would argue Part of the reason for that is we start looking at money again as a goal instead of a tool. When you start seeing it as a tool, you realize that it's one of many tools. So we not only have our money as a tool, but we have our time, our energy, our love, our creativity, our skills. So when you're at that point where you're worried about getting dinner on the table, you're like, I'm going to do what I need to at this job to make it work, even if I have to grind it out, even if I hate my job. So maybe you can't maximize the money tool at that point, but maybe you can work on your time. Maybe you're working eight to six Monday through Friday, but you're young and you have some energy. Maybe on Saturday night, you spend a few hours working on a side hustle. And here's the key. Work on a side hustle that you're passionate about. Find something that you really does relate to your identity and purpose and start working on that. One of two things happens. You do it and you make no money at it, but at least you were doing something that was really meaningful to you. That's a good way to spend your time on that Saturday night. But what if you do start making a little money? What if that allows you to back off slightly at your nine to five or your eight to six and maybe make a little extra money doing something you like? You've already utilized your time better. You've started working on purpose and identity even when you had very little money and you're making headway. Maybe that side hustle grows. Maybe it takes up 50% of your time. Maybe it eventually takes up 100% of your time. The idea is what other tool sets do we have even when we don't have that oxygen, right? If we have enough oxygen just to breathe, we can start working with those other tools. So I think this message is just as important when you don't have money as when you do. What's changed in healthcare? The opportunities, the lifestyle, and you. Now's the perfect time to explore locum tenens and see how it might fit into your career story. Trust me, 
This is not a one-size-fits-all solution for everyone, and the variety of opportunities might surprise you. I recommend starting your research at locumstory.com, an unbiased educational resource about locum tenants. You're going to find stories of locum physicians from all walks of life, so you get a bigger picture of the diverse options. The Locum Story website also has a tool that lets you explore locum's pay and demand for your specialty and even compare to different locum tenants agencies. There's even a simple quiz to see if locums is a right fit for you. Locums could be an essential part of your career that adapts to your needs. Do your own research at locumstory.com. It's easy. Link is in the show notes. Okay, so let's get into this book specifically about being a hospice doctor. So you're definitely speaking with patients, taking care of folks when they are last several months of living very interested how many times are people or folks who are on their deathbeds or you know starting that process talking about well they reached their fi number and they reached a they wish they reached more <laughs> versus right which goes to your point all of this regret on the side i wish i did instead of doing you know doing overtime on saturday and sunday i wish i had worked on the side hustle or i wish i had reconciled or i wished um i did x y and z talk to me about that because you have a perspective that I think a lot of people don't have. I think maybe if you are in medicine and you are in geriatrics, maybe if you are in ER, trauma surgery, you kind of we can kind of grasp it. But you're there with someone. You understand those conversations. Talk to us about that. What are they talking about? FI or are they talking about some regret? I mean, no one, no <laughs> one I've ever taken care of says, man, I'm on my deathbed and I wish I had spent more nights and weekends working. I mean, no one says my net worth only got to a million and I really, I wanted to get to one five and I'm going to really regret dying and never getting there. No, people bemoan the fact that they never had the courage to do the things that were important to them. Maybe it was energy. Maybe it was time. That's what they regret. And so why, oh, why do we wait until our deathbeds to start thinking about these things? Because I will tell you, I've taken care of young people, middle-aged people, and old people. And very few people want to spend the time thinking about those things. But the dying, that's all they want to think about. So put this into perspective. You find out you're dying. You realize that all that BS you've been carrying on your shoulders about what society wants out of you, what you're supposed to do what a good life is supposed to look like, what you saw on Instagram, all of a sudden, all that falls away because now you really, it's, you've been freed, right? You know, time is limited. I can't put it off. Now I have to think about what I really want or aspire towards. What if we had that freedom when we were 20 or 30 or 40? What if we had that freedom, even if we were still scrounging to make enough money from day to day? I think the thought process of, Allowing yourself that freedom, being aspirational and letting go of what society expects out of you is so powerful. And that's one of the things that dying really has to teach. So, you know, for the folks who are like, look, I, I hear what he's saying. And I don't want to wait till, like you said, when you get that diagnosis or you realize that, hey, there's not much more time I have on this earth. What's the best way to figure out what are your purposes and values? Because I think when you don't put it in that context of, Hey, you, you like, for example, me, like I've, I now look at life, like, Hey, I only got like 37 summers to go. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, I only got, yeah. Like, right. If you look at it from that perspective, then you're like, look, I got to get as much out of this life as possible. But I think one of the biggest struggles is like you said, like this purpose, figuring out life, it sounds like so metaphysical. It sounds like there's something in the clouds though. People don't, it's not palpable, right. Until you're forced to start thinking like, okay, what am I besides this job? If I can't work or if I had to really if I had everything in front of me and I wanted to do what I really prefer to do, what is that? And I think, you know, in your book, you you talk about, you know, just something as simple as taking some time. Talk to us about how you figure that out. So I think the first thing we have to do is something that's extremely uncomfortable for a moment. We have to take our finances and put them on the side. So up until this point, we've been trying to use our finances to fund purpose, identity, and connections. And I'm going to suggest to you that we actually have to use purpose, identity, and connections to then decide how to build a financial structure. So I think the first thing we have to do is just give ourselves a touch of breathing room when it comes to our finances, put them on the side, 
and start thinking about purpose, identity, and connections. Because once we do that, I believe we can create a financial structure that fits us much better. And we can start enjoying life today as opposed to waiting to some time that we supposedly have enough money. So that's that big emotional step that I think we have to start with. Once you do that, then becomes the harder question, the real hard work that I'm suggesting you do. You have to start identifying and defining your purpose, identity, and connections. There's a lot of ways to do this. The dying have taught me a few things. One is when it comes to purpose, what we do with hospice patients is we do something called a life review. And we literally sit down with our hospice patients, especially after their pain and nausea are managed, and we have a safe place for them to be and their family is surrounding them. Usually the doctor, nurse, chaplain, social worker, one of the staff will sit down and go through a series of questions with the person about their life that really pushes them to think about what did they accomplish? What didn't they accomplish? What were those most important life events? I what was does it reading mean? That. I didn't yeah. even as a physician, I didn't know that that was a conversation that was occurring. Yeah. Yeah. And so know. we do this with the dying patients. The real big question is, why don't we do this with young, healthy people every year? Like, why don't we use this wonderful perspective to start evaluating our life now? And if you don't want to go through a full que structured questionnaire, I actually have one in the book. But if you don't want to go through that whole questionnaire, just ask yourself the really simple question. If you were lying on your deathbed, bemoaning your life, you'd say something like, I really regret that I never had the energy, courage, or time to... And whatever comes next is really essential to what your purpose is. And so I think it's a really great visualization to start with. This is not something you're going to answer today or tomorrow. This is a long-term question you have to pose to yourself. You can go through a structured life evaluation. You can find them online. You can certainly find them in my book. After that, you have to start working on identity. And one of my greatest uh, exercises for identity is a simple one. You kind of repeat the question, I am, and then you fill in the blank. And so you, you don't push put your yourself. profession on there. Well, that's the first thing I did. As I said, I am a doctor. And first, being a doctor, I found eventually wasn't the identity that fit me, but it was the first thing that came out of my mouth. After that, I started talking about family relationships, like I'm a spouse, right? I'm a child. I'm a parent. Again, that thing's all near and dear to me, but it's not the essential of who I am. Eventually, I got to achievements, like I'm a Plutus Award winner for Earn and Invest podcast, mm -hmm. all very important. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. What I really came down to is I'm a podcaster, a blogger, a public speaker, a writer. I'm a communicator. And it took me a long time of asking myself this question, making the statement. I had to be aspirational, right? It, not just who I am today, but who I really strive to be. And that's what you got to do. You start with purpose. What would I reg regret when I'm dying? You start working on identity. And when purpose and identity start to fall in place, something amazing happens you start making connections, deeper connections than you ever made before. My example is I grew up as a doctor. In medical school, I had very few doctor friends. I hated hanging out in doctor's lounges. I'd go to a party with my wife and I would get embarrassed and ashamed to tell people what I did for a living. And it was silly, right? Because being a doctor, it's a source of pride. Like it's this right. great profession. It's the last noble profession that a lot of yeah. people say. The only time I finally realized why I was having such a disconnect is this identity, this cloak I was wearing on my outsides wasn't matching that identity on my insides, which was being a communicator. And that disconnect made me feel profoundly uncomfortable. Once I started connecting to who I was on the inside, I started going to personal finance conferences and talking to writers and podcasters and bloggers. And it was like, I felt a closeness to these people within minutes that I hadn't had in years in the doctor community so purpose, identity, and connections, there's a series of steps, some exercises. You have to be intentional. This doesn't happen today or tomorrow. This is something you do over months and years, but I believe it's the fuel that's necessary to then start thinking about your finances. If you're looking for a podcast that moves the health conversation outside of the box, then I highly recommend Healthy Conversations, the acclaimed podcast from CVS Health, hosted by Dr. Daniel Kraft, the Harvard and Stanford trained physician scientist, Healthy Conversations provides cutting edge information about the forefront of medical practice. On each episode, Dr. Kraft sits down for one on one interviews with doctors and tech innovators who are transforming healthcare to address some of the most pressing issues. If you're looking for entrepreneurial inspiration, then I recommend their episode on how the NHS evolved to support physician entrepreneurs. This is where Dr. Kraft interviews Dr. Tony Young of England's National Health Service on medical innovation. Or listen to their recent conversation on neurodiversity 
with legendary animal behaviorist and autism advocate Tempo Grandin. So look, don't miss out. Listen to Healthy Conversations from CVS Health. It's available for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast. Link is in the show notes. I appreciate that explanation. I also feel like that's a great way to talk to young attendings, residents, because I think sometimes they, and I was there, it's hard to determine what your deal breakers are, right? Particularly when you're so used to accepting whatever is given to you. And a lot of times, yes, the, in exchange for becoming a doctor, you possibly you may have to take some abuse. You may have to take a lack of sleep. You may have to take an ability to not say no. But I think once you understand what your purpose is and you take the time to figure out what your identity is and what you will stand for and what you won't stand for, you start to realize that, hmm, before I take this job or before, you know, I continue to move forward in this relationship with whatever it may be, hospital clinic or whoever it may be. I have to be very honest with myself as to what's driving me, what I'm going to say no to, and go from there. So I'm interested with you because I know that you made a big pivot in your life years ago. At this point right now, does Dr. Jordan have any regret in his life? So I always toggle this idea with regret versus also realizing that I got to where I am today because of the trials and tribulations of what I went through. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say, I wish I did something different only in the sense that I don't know if I'd have the understanding or the meaning that I now have if I hadn't gone through those things. But let me give you an example of what it looks like to put purpose and identity first and how it could have changed my trajectory. Mm, okay, that's good. So when I started medical school, you know what the first thing I did was within the first week of medical school, I went up to the hospital and I volunteered in the inpatient hospice unit. It was a calling for me. Like my dad had died when I was young and I was like, I should help dying families. First, first patient I ever saw first week of medical school before I ever did any clinicals was on the hospice volunteer ward at Northwestern University. But what did you think you were going to offer at that point? Like emotional support at this point? Just or? support or physical support. You know, I spent some days doing people's laundry up on the floor mm -hmm. because they were there and they'd been there multiple days. I collect their laundry. We had a laundry machine. I'd spend other times literally shredding papers because the desk people were too busy taking care of clinical issues and no one had time to shred papers. So I shredded the papers. Eventually I learned how to go and sit with families and I would just sit in the room and let's say someone was dying and their spouse or parent was sitting in the room and they were kind of lonely and they had been there for hours. You know, you'd go and you'd sit next to them and not say a word. And these were the experiences I had. I learned how to be with the dying and their families. When I got into residency, there was not a moment that I thought about becoming a hospice doctor out of, off the bat. I'm like, it pays very little. You know, I want to be, I want to be the investigative doctor who solves all the complex problems and, and who makes lots of money and, and lives that kind of doctor life. So for the next 15 years, I burnt out in general internal medicine. Only did I get back to hospice when I decided I needed to become financially independent. And I picked up hospice as a side hustle because they would offer me a monthly stipend to supervise a team. What if I had started thinking about purpose and identity from day one yeah, when I was in right. my 20s? What if I had connected to the idea that you know what? Hospice really connects with my purpose and identity as a person, something it took me 20 years to figure out later. Like now I'll tell you, I'll do hospice work even if they won't pay me for it. Right. So that's part of my purpose. What if I had connected to that when I was in my 20s, instead of going after this kind of crazy dream of what doctor I thought I was supposed to be? I went into hospice medicine. I made a lot less money. Let's say I made 50 percent less money, but I never burned out. But every day I felt like I was living out my purpose and identity and I was doing what I was uniquely supposed to do in life. I might not have ever found this financial independence journey. I might have just quietly saved and invested and loved my job and worked until I was 65 and 70. And those would have probably been very fulfilling years where I thought I was doing what I was meant to do. So did I end up there? No, I took an incredibly different circuitous path to end up doing hospice now and loving it, as well as developing other parts of my life. 
would life have been different if I had worked on purpose and identity earlier? I probably would have enjoyed it much more. And I certainly wouldn't have burned out in medicine so quickly. Well, you probably would not have had the community or built a community that you have right now, which is basically having a whole bunch of people who, you know, are listening to your podcast, you know, reading what you have to read. And, and also at the same time, you're helping them change their lives and their perspectives also. So, but I do appreciate the perspective that you bring towards the end of the book. You talk about time, right? Mm. And once again, like I read the book, I thought it was great, but I was really interested in the order. The beginning is money is like oxygen. You got to get your, your face mask on first, but at the end you talk about time. Why? So, you know, there is so much to this discussion. And so I had to think about what's the best way to order it. I felt like I had to begin the opening volley had to talk about philosophically what money means in our life. I felt like the second part really had to give you a pathway towards financial independence and talk about the different ways of getting there. The last part is about time because I think that's our reward. So we love to commoditize time. We love to say you can buy or sell it. You can exchange or trade it. You and I both know that in reality, we can't do any of that. Time passes and we have zero control over it. Yeah. But I like to see our future as a series of time slots. So the time slots occur and we can't stop them and we can't slow them down. The only thing we really can do for the most part is decide which activities to put in those time slots. So my feeling is the first part was to understand the philosophy. The second part was to give you some real tools and how to build your financial life. The third part was to teach you how to pivot so that we could fill up those time slots as much as possible with purposeful activities so that they would feel valuable, so that we feel like we were quote unquote using our time well. What people don't realize is life is a series of decisions those decisions will eventually help us decide what activities to put in those time slots. Let's try to make those activities as meaningful as possible for as much of that time as possible. And so that's why I really wanted to put that in the end, because what we're really investing is how we utilize our time and what we decide to invest in during that time. And so it's really easy to use the word invest and think about money or equities or those kind of things. But what I'm really investing here is in ourselves. I'm investing in our health, in our both physical and emotional health. We're investing in the people around us. We're investing mm-hmm. in forgiveness. We're investing in grace, right? We're investing in all these important things that make life feel meaningful. Again, I want to end with this idea that money is a tool to invest in the more important things, as opposed to we should really, our goal should be investing in businesses or stocks or things to make more money. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. We need to be investing in our lives. You know, 10 years in now, like it's official this year, actually, so actually July 1st would be 10 years. So we've already passed that point for me of practicing on my own, you know, with no attendings around. And I definitely think my best asset, the most, um, the asset that I wish I had more time or more of obviously is time. And nobody tells you this when you finish. Mm -hmm. Nobody tells you how important your time is because you're so used to always thinking three years ahead or four years ahead when I finish my residency, when I finish my fellowship, or when I pay off debt. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because you talk about the one more year syndrome, right? And I think a lot of professionals suffer from this. Whatever situation you're in, law school, medical school, nursing, whatever it may be. I think a lot of people suffer from this one year syndrome. They have golden handcuffs. They may be given a significant amount of money and that money is supposed to keep them at a, at a certain employment for three years or four years or five years. Let's talk about that. The golden handcuffs. Um, I've now, whenever I talk to residents, people who come out, I say, listen, um, I just, be, I'm very honest. And I say, look, you know, maybe you just should not take you know, this two year or this three year, uh, what do you call it? Um, sign on bonus, just work there for a year. See if you like it and go from there. What are your thoughts on, you don't have to have a take on my, my thoughts, but what are your thoughts on the one more year syndrome, golden handcuffs, all those different things? I think those are meant to put off the difficult work, right? So if we look again in that framework, that there are certain set number of time slots in our life, we don't know because we don't know if we'll live to 40 or 80, 
We don't know how many time slots we have, but we do know that we have a modicum of control over what we put in those time slots. The one more year syndrome or the golden handcuffs are pretty much forcing you to fill that time with something you may no longer enjoy. Mm. If you don't enjoy work and yet you're making money at work, money again becomes a lot like oxygen. You already have enough oxygen producing more isn't going to do much for you. But you know what's really meaningful is taking some of those limited time slots you have left that are passing no matter what you do and controlling what activities you put in those time slots, especially with golden handcuffs. When you become a victim of golden handcuffs, you're giving someone else the power to fill your time slots. When it's one more year, you're letting fear fill those time slots. But whether it's someone else, why are you talking to me, man? I feel like you're talking to me. (laughs) You're talking to. (laughs) I know the the audience is listening, but I really want the audience to understand. Like, I feel what he's saying so much, but keep going. (laughs) I was just saying, you know, when you become a victim of those things, you're becoming a victim of a either fear or someone else's needs and wishes. And it's incredibly powerful when we take control over deciding what to put in those time slots. And that's kind of what I want to remind people is that's a huge, powerful thing. And we've got to be way more intentional about it. You know, I, um, you know, oftentimes when I look at a book, I'm just like, well, okay, what exactly do I want to get from this from like a 30,000 foot view? And if I was someone who was coming right out of school, whatever school it may be, Like, why would I pay attention to something like this? I actually think that this should be required reading for someone who's either transitioning from finishing school, whatever it may be, to finishing residency and so forth. Because I think when you put it in the perspective of, listen, you only got a limited amount of summers left, you're going to die. And it's not about the stack of cash. It's about how you spend that cash and what you're investing in. Like you said, like me 10 years in, like I didn't realize how important health And investing in not just myself and other people is, but sometimes a lot of people don't figure that out till it's too late. So I think that this is a really dope book that should be given to all residents, all uh, fellows or even medical students so that they can really have a 30,000 foot view on what their life is. I don't know. Maybe we need to make a campaign with the AMA or the AOA or something like that. But um, I really appreciate you writing this book. This is a really really excellent book. And I'm excited for when it comes out on August 2nd. I hope everybody who's listening to this show decides to go out there and listen to this. If you're an attending and you are in a residency, hey, I think one of the best ways if we want to start changing medicine is not just, you know, talking about and speaking about quality of life, but actually taking the next steps. Get this book for your residents, get this book for your fellows and teach them the importance of of quality of life as opposed to just, cash, you know, taking as much cash and building as much cash as possible. So, Dr. Jordan, man, listen, tell folks where they can get this book. Um, I already mentioned in the beginning, but tell folks where they can get this book and let's, let's take it from there. Taking Stock is available anywhere you find books online, Amazon, Books A Million, Target, et cetera. If books you have A Million qu- still exists. Books A Million still exists. It's out there, I swear. Um, uh-huh. If you want to know more about me, the book, or the various things I do, the easiest way is to go to jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T. There you can see links to my Earn and Invest podcast, which is a financial podcast, the Diversify blog, which is a financial blog. And also, I've been writing about medicine since 2005. That blog is somewhat dormant, but there's 13 or 14 years of writing. It's called In My Humble Opinion. All those links are right there, as well as a link to the book itself. If you're just interested in the financial podcast, earnandinvest.com. But either of those places, you'll find plenty of links to everything else. So hold on, before we end the show, I just want everybody to know if this is your first time hearing about Dr. Jordan or Doc G, for years, you were always just known as Doc G, right? Like almost like this anonymous uh, um, pseudonym, basically, just like how there were other healthcare professionals who were writing about FI and other folks who were writing in general, they would have this uh, anonymous name, anonymous uh, background. What made you decide to just kind of come out with your identity. Cause it's just really interesting. I'm just, I still find it shocking. I'm like, I just remember he was doc G. Now we got his whole name. We got what year he was born <laughs> in the back, you know, a little bit of your ethnicity. You come from the middle East. Like it's just all these different things that are just so dope. So what made you decide to just come out and open who you are? 
So originally when I started my blog, I wanted to have the freedom to write about specifics financially. So I talked it over with my wife and we both decided, eh, it's probably good that I don't use my real name. Over time, I started talking less about specifics and got more comfortable with using my name, but there was never a reason to really cross over. When I decided to write the book, I'm like, okay, I need to you know, author this book under my real name. And I also felt that at this point, when I was connecting my hospice life with my financial life, I had been a figure in the healthcare social media space for many, many years blogging about medicine. So I wanted to connect those personas so that it was the same person who was talking about medicine and what it felt like to be a doctor and then connect that to this guy, Doc G, who was talking about finances and what financial independence felt like. I feel like this book is where both of those coalesce. So I wanted to use my real name. Well, I'm glad you found Harmony. I think it's great. And, um, you know, for all the other doctors who are like anonymous or the other bloggers who are anonymous, I always wonder, I'm like, where is that point where, you know, we'll start to, I know Physician on Fire did that, Leaf Dalene yeah, finally did yeah. that. And everybody seems super happy once they get to that point. So I'm really psyched about you. This is a great book. Everybody, make sure you go ahead and get this book, Taking Stock available on Amazon. We will definitely have the link in the show notes. Dr. Jordan, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. This was a blast.